Hi everyone, it's Ted Bauman here with another installment of my YouTube series. Uh, these are going to be coming out on Fridays from now on as part of the Bauman Daily. Uh, if you're accessing it through that, uh, thanks for subscribing. Uh, if you've come across it in some other form, uh, please do consider subscribing to the Bauman Daily. Uh, it's my new uh, uh, mostly weekly uh, newsletter that's going to be coming out almost every day of the week. Myself and uh, Clint Lee and sometimes guest authors are going to be writing and uh, sending out videos, of course, always with transcripts uh, for you to review uh, and learn from. Uh, today, I'm going to take a break from my uh, uh, series on competition or lack of competition in the U.S. Uh, economy because I got a very interesting question from a, a chap named Kenneth. Uh, and he said to me, Ted, uh, you talk a lot about the fact that you're an economist. Uh, one thing that I've never heard anyone explain adequately is the difference between monetary and fiscal policy uh, and why uh, we seem to constantly uh, expect the Federal Reserve uh, really to uh, make or break the economy in the stock market. Can you please explain the basics of those two uh, types of policy approach? Well, kind of thank you very much. It really is a great question, and I think um, it's one that every person who's invested in the stock market should be um, thinking about carefully, and uh, I, I would encourage you to listen to this video in its entirety or read the transcript, because what I'm going to say, I think, is something that you don't hear very often. First of all, a monetary policy is essentially the um, manipulation of interest rates to try to influence the uh, level of activity in the economy by making the cost of financial capital uh, higher or lower. Now, uh, essentially, the theory behind it can be simplified uh, maybe by, by calling it supply-side economics. Here's how it works. So uh, imagine that you're an investor and you have a potential uh, business <clears throat> that you want to launch. Let's say you have a million dollars uh, and you think that the uh, profit rate on that uh, investment uh, would uh, run at something around 5% per year, right? So you think you can uh, take a million dollars, start a business, and earn 5% profits every year. Now remember, this is just hypothetical. Uh, real world figures are very different. Now let's say that the interest rate that the Federal Reserve is currently charging is 6%, or rather the Federal Reserve has set the rate at 6%, and that's what banks are offering because that's the way the, the system works. Now, um, would you start a business at 5%? Probably not. You'd probably put your thousand dollars, or sorry, million dollars in the bank and get six percent interest. By contrast, if the Federal Reserve set the prevailing rate of interest throughout the economy at four percent, um, it would make sense to launch your uh, business uh, because you could earn an extra percentage point through profits. Now, obviously, that's a very simple explanation. Um, it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, earning money by putting it in the bank uh, doesn't involve much effort, but running a business does. So typically, the magnitudes are much larger. But the basic mechanism is the same. The idea is that by reducing the interest rate, you're reducing the potential return that investors could earn by putting their money into a financial instrument like uh, a bank account. Um, the lower you make the, uh, the interest rate, the more likely it is that investors will make the decision, pull the trigger, go ahead, start a new business, uh, because they can get a higher rate of return by investing in a business, as opposed to putting money in the bank. That's the theory anyway. Uh, the problem with that theory, and there are a couple of them, is that first of all, nobody invests uh, simply because of the cost of capital. They also invest based on the likelihood that people will actually buy their products. Just because uh, I can get access to a business loan cheap doesn't mean that I'm necessarily going to use it to start a business if there's no customers out there in the economy uh, who want to buy my stuff. So whereas monetary policy primarily targets the, uh, the cost of capital and tries to manipulate it to encourage uh, more investment, including investment by consumers uh, in, in buying vehicles and buying other things on credit, um, fiscal policy, on the other hand, works by taking uh, government money and spending it in the economy directly to try to um, stimulate uh, actual economic activity. Now, uh, I've mentioned already that financial or rather monetary policy is essentially focused on just the cost of capital, right? It's, it's, it's really about trying to increase the rate of return uh, on investments relative to 
uh, what you could get simply by putting money into a bank or into bonds, treasury bonds, or whatever other kinds of financial instruments. So it's a supply side mechanism. It only focuses on capital and investment and businesses. Fiscal policy, on the other hand, um, is designed to uh, basically focus on all sectors of the economy at once. For example, when the government undertakes a big uh, infrastructure spending program, fixing bridges, fixing highways, building new schools, building hospitals, all the kinds of things that happened during the New Deal, um, that money goes out into the economy. It is spent on businesses who build things. They pay their workers wages. Now, when you um, put a dollar into the economy, uh, if you're the government, um, let's say I earn that dollar, uh, I'm going to take that dollar and use it to buy something else from somebody else. So that person is going to earn a dollar and so on and so forth. The person I gave it to is going to spend it on something else. So you get what's called the multiplier effect. So fiscal policy is designed to try to boost economic activity in the economy by putting money in people's pockets, by doing useful things like building government, uh, sponsored um, infrastructure and so on in the expectation that people will take that money that they earn doing that, spend it on other goods and services. And if the economy is at a low point, it will kickstart other economic activity. Uh, restaurants will open up to sell food to workers on government sponsored highway programs. Uh, people will um, start uh, making the investments into consumer goods because they know that <clears throat> an increasing number of people out in the economy will have money to spend. So one of the primary differences between monetary policy and fiscal policy is that whereas monetary policy is primarily focused on or primarily focused on the owners of capital assets, whether they're businesses or financial assets, fiscal policy is directed towards the economy as a whole and brings immediate benefits to working people in the form of wages, whether they are directly paid by government uh, investment in the economy or through the multiplier effect. Now, uh, there are lots of pros and cons for both. There are certainly big ideological arguments over which one is preferable. But one thing I always like to do whenever I look at an issue like this is ask a question. In Latin, the question is cui bono? And what it means is who benefits? Now, I know that's a little cynical, but I know uh, in this part of the early 21st century, a lot of people are getting pretty cynical about politics and economics and things like that. So I don't think it'll surprise you that I'm asking who benefits from one policy path versus the other? Well, we tend to see the dominant message in the financial press, certainly uh, in uh, big journals like the Wall Street Journal, but even uh, to a large extent in even the so-called liberal newspapers like the New York Times or the Washington Post, there's a, a decided preference for monetary policy and a reluctance to embrace fiscal spending by the government. Now, why would that be the case? Let's leave aside the um, underlying economic arguments for the most part and focus on why different people might be interested in one or, or the other. Now, if you are a, a financial investor and let's say that you have in, uh, invested uh, money in securities that um, uh, reflect lending to uh, uh, consumers in the economy, you know, for example, lots of banks sell uh, collateralized debt obligations where People who buy homes, for example, uh, their mortgages are bought up, put into a big pile, and then they are resold to investors. Now, if you have invested in a debt instrument, in other words, where somebody is going to be paying back um, a debt and you're going to uh, get interest earnings on that instrument, inflation is your enemy. The last thing in the world you want is for um, the, uh, uh, the price level in the economy to rise. Let's say, for example, that you lent money out at 5% at the beginning of the year. Let's say you lent $100. At the end of the year, you want to get $105 back. But if inflation is running at 10% per year, that $105 uh, is actually a loss for you. Um, you could, the same goods that you could have bought at the beginning of the year for $100, you won't be able to buy for $105 at the end of the year because uh, your earnings were 5% short of the inflation rate. So traditionally, uh, financial investors, the banking sector, Wall Street, the big money people have been very favorable towards monetary policy because it emphasizes trying to keep inflation as low as possible. Now, there are lots of theoretical reasons that they point to why uh, that should work and why it's a good thing. But one thing that they can no longer say is that having super low interest rates for long periods of time 
uh, creates inflation. It certainly hasn't in the last 10 years. Now, there's a whole big argument as to why that's the case. But the one thing that you still see a lot of is a lot of warning signs from people saying, well, if we keep these low interest rates, if the Fed lowers rates too much, we're going to start seeing inflation. And inflation, ooh, ooh gosh, it's terrible. Well, actually, a little bit of inflation in the economy is a good thing because it actually spurs people to want to start businesses to capture some of those rising prices. But as I said, inflation is really scary to people who make their money by collecting loan repayments from other people because it, it reduces the actual real value of the principal that is being repaid as well as the interest rate uh, that is being uh, recovered on those loans. So if you're a big money investor who's got money in lending, um, which is really most of the, the Wall Street uh, banks, all the big investment houses specialize in it, um, you don't want inflation. And so at the level of self-interest, monetary policy and type uh, monetary policy is going to be your preference. On the other hand, uh, if you are a wage earner, if you're an ordinary small business person who depends largely on the uh, income that they get from people uh, either hiring workers or uh, buying your goods and services and things like that, like local car dealers, uh, uh, tradespeople like plumbers and electricians and so on. Um, anybody who is basically dependent on the flow of actual money through the economy as opposed to debt um, is going to like fiscal policy because it means that the government is, in a sense, pushing the economy to start operating. You know, it's the, the, when the government spends money, it filters through. It's, it's like um, a set of dominoes. Each person uh, who receives some of that money that is spent spends it to somebody else. And so you get this, this big boost in economic activity. Now, uh, after the 2008-2009 uh, financial collapse, the government uh, under uh, Obama in the White House, but also the Republicans and Democrats, agreed in the Senate uh, and the House uh, for a big recovery package. It was $800 billion, nearly a trillion dollars. And the logic behind that was that because the economy had seized up and because people had stopped investing and stopped spending money, that if the government stepped in and made up the difference, that it would restart the economy. It's like priming the pump. <clears throat> in fact, that's what they call it. Um, it. Basically, it would get the engine going again, and that multiplier effect would get the economy moving again. But just as important as the fact that it would get the economy moving in quickly, it would also directly put money in people's pockets by uh, sending that money into real goods and services as opposed to having that money uh, go into financial activity, which tends to be the case with monetary policy. If the government spends a trillion dollars on new infrastructure improvements, that money goes into brick and mortar, cement manufacturers, uh, Caterpillar, companies that make um, engines, Briggs and Stratton, you know, all the, the big Cummings, diesels, all those people are going to make money because they're going to be selling <clears throat> equipment and materials that go into uh, brick and mortar infrastructure. And again, you're going to get this big, uh, you know, domino effect of, of uh, expansion throughout the economy. And it's immediate. Everybody sees it. Everybody feels it. On the other hand, if you cut interest rates, the tendency is for uh, people who have access to large scale financing, Typically, people who already have a lot of money are able to get their hands on it one way or another, and then they go looking for returns. Now, if the real economy is not strong, if there's no fiscal policy that's pushing to, you know, to get that multiplier going, what, what happens and what we've seen for the last 10 years is that this loose monetary policy results in people taking money that's available at low cost through the Fed by them buying back um, treasury bonds and all that sort of stuff, that money that comes back then goes into the stock market. And the stock market then uh, rises, even though the economy itself may be going very slowly. So if you look at the average rate of growth of stock values in the United States over the last decade, uh, roaring some cases of over 20% per year, like last year, compare that to the rate of growth of the economy, intuitively, it doesn't really make sense why that should be. Well, the reason is because we've only had financial monetary policy in this country. We have not had significant fiscal expansion ever since that initial injection back in 2009. Ever since the government has uh, resisted spending, and it's largely, and let's be honest about it, it's largely because the Republican Party, which has uh, maintained control of the Senate uh, ever since those days, does not want to see uh, additional spending. They argue that they don't want the government to go into debt. 
Um, but ultimately, um, you have to go back and look at the constituencies behind the two different kinds of policies. Who benefits from them? Monetary policy, a focus on monetary policy is primarily of benefit to financial uh, people, people who have lots of financial resources, who already have lots of assets, um, and it helps them uh, not only to get access to cheap money to invest in stocks and land and other assets, but it helps to avoid inflation, which would undermine the value of their debt holdings. Fiscal policy, on the other hand, is something that would benefit ordinary people very rapidly throughout the economy uh, in the way that John Maynard Keynes originally uh, uh, predicted. So you'll hear arguments about Keynesians versus monetarists, but the bottom line is that the different approaches to economic policy in the world today, especially in the United States, have very different implications for different groups of people and their interests. And right now, monetary policy is the only game in town, largely because the people uh, who have the most influence over policy in the United States today remain the owners of capital, particularly financial capital. Now, lots of ordinary working people uh, would probably like to see different policy um, uh, options available and exercised by our government, but really these options are not seriously being considered and they very rarely get spoken about in detail. So that's why I answered Kenneth's question today. I think it's a really, really important issue to think about. Do we really run the risk of massive government deficits if we increase spending? Yes, we do. We're already increasing deficits because the government uh, has dramatically cut taxes over the last three years without reducing spending. Increasing government spending through fiscal policy might involve increasing taxes for some people, but it would have this effect of getting money out into the economy very rapidly, doing good works. We could certainly use some new bridges and highways, um, and it would probably be more effective than monetary policy. It would certainly reach more people. So uh, I'm not a Democrat or a Republican. I'm not a liberal or a conservative. I'm an economist. And my reading of the economy is that uh, fiscal policy is long overdue in the United States. Uh, we need to rethink how it works. And it would be great for you as an investor if there were more companies selling more goods to ordinary wage earning Americans. Uh, and we can see that happening as opposed to just bubble like conditions in many stocks. Anyway, this is Ted Bauman signing off with my YouTube video for this week. If you're not a, a Bauman Daily subscriber, please do subscribe. And of course, if you're not a Bauman Letter subscriber, look at the text under this video uh, and go down and click on the link that will take you to show you the opportunity to be part of the Bauman Letter, where we have many, many really strong gains in our stock portfolio. This is Ted Bauman speaking. I'll talk to you again next week.